But on behalf of my family and I, we thank you for the invitation to come and be with you today. Due to a series of unfortunate events, uh, my wife and kids aren't able to be here today. We had a, uh, as all of you that have raised kids know, you never know what's going to happen from minute to minute. And my little boy woke up this morning not feeling real well, so uh, they're not able to be with us today. But I appreciate so much this opportunity to come back and be with you. And when Brother David extended the invitation to me to come and be with you, immediately I got started thinking about what I would talk about. And over time, I developed a lesson that I have entitled, This Place and That Place. This place is Pine Knot. That place is heaven. Let's start out talking a little bit about Pine Knot. You know, this hillside has been a special place for generations of people, including the families of some of you that are assembled here today. For roughly 180 years, the Lord's people have met in and around this location. And heaven only knows the influence that this good church has had, not only on this community, but on our country and around the world. Many great gospel preachers have come from among your ranks. Many great elders have shepherded this flock through the years. And some outstanding song leaders. I was so glad when I heard that Stan was going to be leading the singing this morning. Stan has always been one of my favorite song leaders to sing with. And Stan does an outstanding job, and you don't need me to tell you this, but you're blessed to have Stan, to have Richard, to have great song leaders in this congregation. And Pine Knot has always been widely known for being a strong sound congregation of the Lord's Church with some of the sweetest singing this side of heaven. And anyone that's been around Pine Knot very long, you know that's the truth. I hold a special place in my heart for this congregation. Pine Knot was the very first place that I served as a preacher. As well, while I was preaching here, I was married to my wife, Christy. Back in April of 2005, I was completing my second year at Crowley's Ridge College and also my second year of youth ministry at Hoxie. And due to the inherent struggles that so often go along with youth ministry, I had decided that I wanted to began focusing more on preaching. I expressed my desire to Art Smith, and a few days later, out of the blue, I received a phone call from Jody McFadden. Jody called me, and one of the first things out of his mouth, he said, do you want to come to Pine Knot and be our preacher? First off, I thought, you know, this is kind of strange. I've never been to Pine Knot. I don't know anybody that uh, that worships at Pine Knot, but yet one of the elders is calling and offering me the position sight unseen. Uh, you know, that's kind of strange. Well, on April the 3rd, 2005, I came to Pine Knot for the first time as the preacher here for this congregation. Folks, I was warmly welcomed. I was made to feel a part of this great family immediately and was greatly encouraged by the members. And some of you were there on that day. And God bless you for coming back again to listen to me again. But I've been encouraged by you through all the years. But to make this arrangement even more unique, I only preached at Pine Knot for four weeks and then I left for three months. I had already arranged to spend the summer in Anchorage, Alaska, working with a congregation there. Well, at the end of 
those first four weeks, I went to Brother Jody and Brother Adrian Denham, and I told them, I said, you know, I said, I, this is an arrangement that I've already had made. I said, if you feel like that you want to find another preacher, please feel free to do so. And I'll never forget, Brother Adrian, he told me, he said, no, he said, you go and do what you need to do. We'll be here when you get back. And Brother Jody filled in for the summer while I was gone. I came back after about three months and was here for several more months. Well, I went to Alaska, came back to Pine Knot around the end of August. Well, about two weeks later, I brought and introduced my new girlfriend to the congregation here at Pine Knot. And I have to say something about that day. Those of you who know Christy, you know that she is somewhat shy until you get to know her. And so coming in that first day, she didn't know anyone other than me. So she came in and she sat in this back corner, just kind of wanted to blend in and not be singled out in any way. But a certain lady came into the building and made a beeline for Christy. She went over and introduced herself to Christy as Almarie Denham. She talked to Christy, and she invited Christy to sit with her and Adrian. Well, you noticed where I sat this morning. Those that have been around Pine Knot for a long time, you know at that end is where Adrian and Al Marie Denham always sat. Well, Christy tried to, to turn down the offer. You know, she, she sure didn't want to come sit on the front row her first day here. But Al Marie was not going to take no for an answer. And I don't know if she was afraid that Christy would get up and leave or what. But she sat there and she held Christy's hand the whole way through services that day. And from that day forward, this was our assigned seat. We sat with them from that day forward. Well, a couple of weeks after I had started preaching here, before I had left to go to Alaska, Brother Jody called me and he said, he said, Adrian and Almarie are going to be celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary and we're throwing a surprise party for them. He said, but I've got something I want you to do. He said, that Sunday night, he said, we're going to wait till services start and we're going to sneak in a lot of their family and their loved ones and have them sit in the back of the building. He said, but I want you to preach a lesson on the blessing of marriage. Well, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, here I am, 20 years old. I had just turned 20. First time I preached here, I was 19, but I had just turned 20. Had never had a serious girlfriend in my life. Had not met Christy yet. But yet I'm being asked to preach a lesson on the blessing of marriage. Well, I put a lesson together. Services started. We snuck in their loved ones. Well, at the end of the lesson, those of you that were here may remember this. Brother Jody stood up and he looked at Adrian and Almarie. He said, do you have any clue why Josh preached that lesson tonight? And they just kind of looked at each other and he said, stand up and turn around. Folks, one of the most precious sights I've ever seen in my life was when that wonderful couple turned around and saw all of their loved ones here. Well, a few months after Christy and I, we were married, and I was invited to begin working with a congregation closer to our home in Pocahontas, and we decided to make that move. And it was difficult to leave, because as I said, Pine Knot is a special place. We weren't here all that long, but you welcomed us in. We became a part of this great family and you have been so encouraging to us through the years. I tried to think back. I believe this is the third time that I've been invited to come back and speak for homecoming uh, since I left Pine Knot. But I've also been able to come back and preach funerals for a few people and to be here for singings and different things through the years. It's always been a blessing. 
to be here at Pine Knot. And it's a blessing to be here with you today. And again, I thank you for that invitation. But that's enough about this place. Now let's talk about another place. We sing about it. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he hath given. How beautiful heaven must be. What do you know about heaven? Have you really just sat down and thought about that question? What do you know about heaven? I heard an old preacher say one time, and the older I get, the more I find this to be true. He said, the older I get, the more I find myself thinking about heaven. We know that heaven is a place. We know that it's huge. We know that it's beautiful. We know that it's eternal. But if you want to know more about heaven, turn to Revelation chapter 21. Read this chapter. Read it again. Read it a third time. And then think about it for a little while. Listen to these beautiful opening verses. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now, brothers and sisters and friends, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to imagine a place like that. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around this type of place. But even more so, it's hard for me to imagine that someone would prepare a place like that for me. But that's what Jesus has gone to do. Do you remember just before Jesus went to the cross, he spent a lot of time with his disciples preparing them for the time of his departure. He knew that it was going to be hard for them. He knew there were going to be things that they would not understand, that they would not be prepared for. He knew it was going to be difficult. And when he gave us that beautiful let not your hearts be troubled passage, folks, he wasn't giving us just a funeral text. What he was doing was comforting the hearts of his disciples. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen to what he says next. I go and prepare a place for you. What does that mean? Folks, it means that heaven is real. Heaven is a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, notice the promise, I will come again. Jesus is coming back. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know in the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now folks, those words from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, were true then, and they're true today. Jesus has gone to prepare 
a place for you and a place for me. Now think about this. A place where there is no sickness. We can't even fathom that, can we? But then he goes even further than that. Where there is no death. Where there is no pain, no sorrow, no crying. He says we won't even be capable of those things. That's just a little glimpse of what that place is going to be like. Do you want to go there? It's okay, you can say yes. Do you want to go there? Yes! Do you know how to go there? But I have another question. How bad do you want to go there? Folks, it takes more than just having your name in a church directory somewhere. It takes more than just believing in Jesus. And it takes more than being baptized, even if it's in an old spring-fed baptistry on top of Crowley's Ridge. Because if you don't really want to go to heaven, you're not going to go there. You know, sometimes we sing a song that expresses those sentiments. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. Folks, I want to go to heaven. And I want you to go with me. But it's so much more important to know how to go to heaven than to know what heaven's really like. Christianity has always been and always will be a taught religion. The way that we learn about God and about His will is because someone taught it to us. Jesus wasn't just talking to hear Himself speak when He said in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there was that word again teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, so often when we think about the plan of salvation, we want to teach, we want to baptize, but then we feel like that's all there is. No, that's just the beginning. Because Jesus said the real Great Commission is to teach, to baptize, and to teach some more. How are people going to know how to get to heaven if they're not taught? We have to teach them the gospel. Earlier, Jesus had spoke to some of the Jews who were believing on Him in John 8, verses 31 and 32, where He says, If you continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, folks, the Bible chronicles for us thousands of people who in the first century heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And each and every one of them, when you dissect what the Bible tells us about the way that they came to be children of God, they did so by hearing the Word of God, believing the message that they heard, Repenting of their sins, confessing Christ, and being baptized for the remission of their sins. Each and every one of them. Now what do we see in that? We see an active faith. We see people who wanted to be Christians, who wanted to go to heaven, and they were willing to do whatever it took to get there. But is that how we are? Are we willing to do whatever it takes to get to heaven. The faith that each one of those individuals that we read about had motivated them to do the right thing. Motivated them to obey the gospel. Why? Because that was the only way they were going to make it to heaven. Do you remember during the Sermon on the Mount 
Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's stop right there for just a moment. He says, Not everyone that professes to be a Christian is going to make it to heaven. But he goes on to say, But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The one that does the Lord's will. Heaven is going to be his home. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, what does this come down to? Well, Matthew 18 and verse 3, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. There has to be a change that must take place. Unless ye be converted. Leave this world behind. Become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Except ye be converted and become as little children. Ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But then in John 3 and verse 5, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now think about this with me for just a moment. When you read through the book of Acts, and you read about those 3,000 souls on Pentecost, you read about people such as Cornelius, Saul of Tarsus, the eunuch, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, all of these people that we read about in the book of Acts who's... Uh, who, who, their conversion is chronicled for us there. Each and every one of these people entered into the kingdom. Each and every one of these people obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and they entered into the kingdom of heaven. And although many of them faced great difficulties as a result of it. You know, we are blessed to live in a country today where we can be children of God and pretty much live without fear of any repercussions because of that. But there are places in the world around us today that do not have those same freedoms. There are places in the world around us today where their lives are still at risk, where people are still being put to death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But we think about those that we read about in the New Testament. We think about the apostles. Folks, there was only one of the apostles that did not die a martyr's death. Now, I'm not considering uh, Judas in this. We know that Judas killed himself and was replaced by Matthias. But only one did not die a martyr's death. And that was the apostle John. But we think about this. During the time of just the first century... The first 77 years of the history of the church, there were three separate periods of great distress that the Christians faced. Very shortly after the church came into establishment, they had the persecution by the Jews that was led by Saul of Tarsus. Later on, they had to flee from their homeland in order to avoid the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then as we get into the 90s, we see that they were facing heavy persecution from the Roman Emperor Domitian. So just within 77 years, we see that they faced three intense periods of persecution. But as we talked about in our Bible class this morning, we see that the church was growing by leaps and bounds. The church was growing more so in those years than the church has ever grown since. Why? Because they wanted to go to heaven. Because they understood that they had a message. They had the gospel and that the only way that mankind was going to be saved from their sins and have the hope of a home in heaven was they had to share it. They had to carry that message. But oh, so many times today we have the mentality, well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. If I don't say something, then Brother David will come along. He'll say something to him. If 
Folks, the Great Commission is for every person. We all have a charge to carry the gospel of Christ out into this world and to reach out to people. No, we may not all be able to do it in the same way. We all may have different talents, different abilities, different things that we can do in furthering the cause of Christ. But we do have a command to do what we can do. But when we look carefully at what the Bible tells us that heaven is like and what is necessary in order for us to go there, let's go off on a little bit of a different train of thought for just a moment. The Apostle Paul was the greatest evangelist that this world has ever known. In Colossians chapter 2, he speaks of that initial obedience to the gospel. And he talks about obeying the first principles of the oracles of God. And he talks about it from the standpoint of circumcision. Now in fleshly circumcision, we know that there is a cutting off and a throwing away. But here, Paul, in comparing our obedience to the gospel with circumcision, he tells us that just as in fleshly circumcision something has to be cut off, he says that when we become children of God, something has to be cut off as well, and that is our devotion to sin. No longer can we live a life devoted to the things of this world and make it to heaven. We have to turn away from the love of sin. Something that I've said many times is that the number one thing that keeps many people from obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ is they love the sin therein. They won't turn away from it. They don't want to give that up. But they don't realize what it is that they are giving up. But coming back to Colossians chapter 2, notice that Paul says it this way, "...in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism." wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's Colossians 2, 11 through 13. But then I want you to know how chapter 3 begins. It begins with these words. If ye then be risen... With Christ. You know, he's just alluded to them being buried with Christ in baptism, being raised to walk in newness of life. But now, notice what he says If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Don't focus on the things of this world. Don't go back into that old way of life. Christ has taken away the old man of sin. Don't resurrect that. Don't bring it back into your life. Focus on those things which are above. Get your mind off of earthly things and think about God. Think about God. Think about Christ. Think about heaven. Think about how much we want to go there. What are we willing to give up in order to go there? But notice Paul continues in this way. He says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify or put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. 
in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever, the culmination of all this thought, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You see what Paul just did in that passage? He showed us how to get to heaven. He said, these are the things you've got to get rid of, and these are the things that you've got to have. Lay aside all these things. Put your affection. Love these things. Devote your life to these things. But once again, if we don't measure up, we're not going to make it. I want to go to heaven. How about you? I want to go to heaven and I want every one of you to be there with me. But even greater than my desire for the salvation of our souls is God's desire to save us. Folks, God wants to save you. Let that sink in for just a moment. God wants to save you. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to go to heaven. Peter said, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men clout slackness, but it's long-suffering. He's patient with us. He's giving us an opportunity to come to Him, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. I want to go to heaven. I want you to go to heaven. But God wants you to go to heaven also. Let me end with this thought this morning. What is it going to profit you if you gain the entire world and lose your soul? What true benefit is there to your life if you stay devoted to the things of this world and then have nothing in the world that is to come? What are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? You know, we can look at that a couple of different ways. Are you willing to give up heaven in order to be devoted to the things of this life? Or are you willing to give up the things of this life in order to make it to heaven? What are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? Do you want to go to heaven this morning? Are you headed that way? Folks, only you can answer that question for yourself. Are you headed that way? Well, if not, why not? What's holding you back? What's keeping you from obeying the gospel of Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, if you do, then act upon that faith. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, what has Jesus commanded us to do? Well, we're told that we must repent. We have to repent of our sins, to turn away from this world, to set our sights, to set our affections on things above. But then we have to be willing to confess Christ 
And this is a subject that through the years I've given considerable thought to because I think so often we have the mentality that confession is just a one-time thing that we do before we're baptized. But it's not. Because when we make a decision that we are going to become children of God, yes, you stand before a congregation of the Lord's people and the preacher asks you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? We call that the good confession. But from that point forward, in everything that we say, in everything that we do, our life is to be a constant confession that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The way that Paul words it, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then submit yourself to the waters of baptism. In those waters, you'll come into contact with the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins will be washed away. That old man of sin will be left in the water. You'll be raised to walk in newness of life. Or it may be that there is someone here who is a child of God. But when you look at your life, and you ask yourself, am I going to heaven? You can't say yes. Maybe you look at yourself and you say, well, I, I think I'm going to heaven. Or I hope I'm going to heaven. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We are to be confident in our salvation. And so if there is something that is in your life this morning that you know is causing doubts to come into your mind and into your heart, repent of those things. Remove whatever it is that's keeping you from being confident in your salvation. Because my desire this morning is for every person, when you leave this place, to be able to say, I want to go to heaven and I know I'm going to heaven. And so if you examine yourself this morning and you ask yourself that question, am I going to heaven? And you cannot reply with a resounding yes. Then we want you to come forward today. I want to speak with you. I want to study with you. I'm sure Brother David would be willing to do the same. Because we do not want any person to leave this place today not in a right relationship with God. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.